All right, so uh, in lesson two, we're going to talk about development of the methodology memorandum that precedes the ACE study. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so the methodology memorandum itself is a technical memo that describes the goals of the ACE study and basically how we're going to intend to conduct the study. So it identifies your um, alternative corridors that you might want to uh, look at eventually. It details the data and the process that the district will use to develop, evaluate, and screen the corridors. So um, one thing that the, it specifically gets into is the actual methodologies that will be used, the proposed public involvement, stakeholder outreach, and especially the criteria that we're going to use to form our basis of decision making. Occasionally, you will have a project that has a previous study that's already been completed. So in that case, it's a simple matter to uh, refine the previous methodology memorandum. It's also important to remember that ACE studies do occur within the ETDM screening process. So that means that um, when you prepare the draft version of your methodology memorandum, then uh, the lead agency and the ETAT team is going to uh, offer comments and they're going to review your draft uh, memorandum. And so a great practice here is to coordinate with OEM when you're thinking about it. Uh, they are looking at all the statewide uh, studies that are going on. And so uh, uh, typically they will probably be acting as the lead agency for a federal project that we'll talk about more in a little bit, but they might actually have uh, some methodology memorandums recently that are very similar to a project like yours. So it's a great jump start for you. Next slide. Okay, so uh, the first thing we do, of course, is uh, conduct an initial preliminary screening through ETAT. This is before your methodology memorandum. This is to get your initial stakeholder comments and comments from the ETAT on the project itself, things to be aware of, of course. So uh, as we're preparing for the methodology memorandum, the first thing we want to do is just review the initial work that we did prior to even sending out that first screening to the ETAT. So you will have gathered some data there. There might be some updates, of course, from the ETAT team and other stakeholders or the public that are coming in. Uh, one notable item here is that summary degree of effect rating that you receive from uh, various categories from the agencies. Those are those uh, values that are associated like uh, I don't know, if, if you're in a endangered species area, is there going to be no impact, minimal, moderate, substantial, um, and there's even room for listing enhancements, that the project will be an enhancement to something, so let's not forget that. As well, the, the biggie that we want to watch out for is whether agencies are identifying that there's going to be a, a potential issue with this project that, that will require future resolution, mitigation, whatever, and so we can look at these previous studies, we can conduct our updated GIS views, and then uh, obviously a field trip is always a great idea. So uh, in the ETDM manual, chapter four, there are some guides to, uh, and, a, and a small outline, if you will, uh, for the methodology memorandum. So you can look further there. And again, OEM, I think a great, a great strategy here is to find some that have already been done, particularly good ones, right? Okay, next slide. So <clears throat> shown here are the high level components that are found in the memo. We'll cover the details of each in a moment. So uh, offering, uh, well, I, let's just move on to the next slide. Just go right into it. All right, so the first part, this isn't dissimilar from any environmental type document or study. We're gonna have some background information. So we definitely wanna have that uh, adoption notice that, that FDOT intends to adopt this into uh, the pd and &E, uh, study. Yeah, that's a requirement for Pell. Uh, then we have our NEPA assignment, the standard statement that you all are familiar with by now. So at this point, we want to talk about what the purpose of our project is, the purpose of the methodology memorandum, and giving a brief overview of the ACE process. This is where we just have our normal boilerplate contact information. We list our project description, and then we have some of the basic project information, as well as uh, listing and documenting what some of those previous studies were. Let's move on. So now we're starting to get into the meat of it. Uh, yeah, when you're in your goals and objective 
objective section. This is where you're establishing some of the analysis methodology and the framework, uh, some of your key decision points that you anticipate that are then going to help you to establish a public and agency engagement strategy. Um, a quick mention of project status is appropriate. In other words, where do things lie with previous studies or any previous ETAT reviews? Then we start marching into identifying the specific goals and objectives. It's important to remember that um, a start, startup scenarios can vary, as Sylvia was talking about a little bit earlier. Thus, one has to consider where you're starting and where you're going to end and, uh, with, your, with your goal determination. And those were those various scenarios uh, in that scenario slide that she talked about. Next slide. Okay, getting to specifics. When we talk about the analysis methodology, here are some typical components that would be included. Um, and these are the data needs, the uh, actual corridor constraints that you might identify, uh, considering and identifying uh, your study area and refining that uh, into corridors. What are going to be your criteria for analysis and evaluation and your methods, as well as what is your approach to eliminating alternatives? So let's uh, start diving into some of those a little bit. Data needs, this is the normal stuff that you're used to. This is encompasses your spatial data and other information that are pertinent to developing the corridor, it's likely that you will be collecting the same type of infrastructure, natural environment features, human environment considerations. Of course, human environment often goes beyond spatial data and, and that's talking with people. Um, as well, are there gonna be, are there any previous planning efforts with information that's already available? Uh, your local governments can help you out here as well. And then are there gonna be any required updates uh, to, to help you with that information. So another primary data source here is obviously going to be that initial in, input that you get from ETAT on that first uh, screening event and as well from the public and any pertinent stakeholders for your project. Next slide. Okay, um, corridor constraints is definitely a big issue, uh, it requires some judgment. But I think the best way to start talking about this is to offer you uh, a definition. So corridor constraints represent the physical location of existing infrastructure, protected resources, and planned development. These can present substantial issues and thus challenges to the feasible selection of unidentified corridor. And, and so off, obviously this often means that we try to avoid or minimize impacts to these uh, constraints. And so Often we start with just identifying what your resources are in your project area. Uh, not all of these are going to be project constraints. Certain resources will, uh, if you will, they rise to the level of being an identified constraint where you see some big issues with, uh, with hitting something. So um, some sources for these uh, resources identification are going to be your preliminary uh, environmental discussion, certainly the input that you get from ETAT or stakeholders. You might conduct further GIS, or Chris was talking about land suitability mapping. You have uh, local government and stakeholders that are going to kick in, particularly local government, I've found, is, is very helpful to let you see things. Um, as well, uh, let's not forget, to, F dot districts know the area better than anybody else. You've got the relationships out there. Uh, the Environmental Management Office obviously is good at uh, the resource aspect, but I wouldn't. I would say, don't forget your planning staff. They're always working with your MPOs and your local governments. They often have advanced knowledge of uh, particularly human environment areas. They might know where uh, there are some minority or low-income areas, just for an example. And finally, uh, like we were talking about earlier, good old-fashioned field truthing is invaluable. So field trips are a great thing to consider. And often you precede that by uh, a, a quick look at GIS data or aerial photos. Let's move on. So as we start to develop land suitability mapping or, or even constraint type mappings, certainly it's no surprise that spatial data is essential to this. It gives us our first sense of where things lie on the landscape. So uh, here is where the uh, FDOT Area of Interest tool provides that preliminary screening, and then you can go into more detail uh, with other GIS uh, efforts, as well as coordination. So <clears throat> here's the fun part, I think. As you start to overlay all these resources, and particularly the ones that you call constraints, 
onto mapping, then uh, the angels start to sing, right? And you start to see the promising locations for corridor alignments just begin to appear. And these are basically the areas on your map that are blank, that don't have a lot of shading or, or infrastructure on that. And then based on that, we can start to design our various corridor alignments uh, based on the widths, of course and then uh, try to minimize the impact of those. So many resources are gonna present obvious locations and boundaries. For example, if you see infrastructure, it's obvious where that is. Parks, historic architecture, um, yet other e resources out there are not gonna have uh, clear boundaries, or they might even have boundaries that change over time. This might be wetlands, uh, wetland delineations, for example, or the known habitat of endangered species. And then one note of caution I put out there, um, a lot of you seasoned folks know this, is that, hey, it's easy to identify what's already on the land but um, and, and what's above ground, <clears throat> but we also have to pay attention to utilities that are below ground, checking those out. Um, we can see buildings, highways, railroads, waterways as examples, but we want to look further and even talk with uh, any managing agencies that might have master plans that would present future development that we need to be aware of. Uh, the FDOT work program is a great example. That has future projects that are coming. Uh, local master plans might have uh, a new, you might have a new mall coming in that you need to be aware of. So there's gonna be the parking and the access, you might have a factory or even a big apartment complex. And there will also be other examples of unmapped features um, that are existing. For example, if you're close to an airport, there is a uh, FAA uh, restriction that's called a runway protection zone, which extends for several thousand feet from each end of a runway to protect the uh, approaching aircraft from obstructions. And so that is an obvious and major developmental constraint on you. So a lot of the uh, identification of what's not on mapping uh, helps as well. Next. So, <clears throat> Now we're moving into identifying and uh, refining our corridors. I don't want to steal thunder here. Sylvia is going to talk about this in lesson three. This is the section where we talk about describing the corridors, how they were developed, how they meet purpose and need, and, and, and perhaps how they will be refined. So I'm going to punt that down line for uh, Sylvia to talk about in lesson three. <clears throat> As well, she's going to talk about our analysis and evaluation criteria. Um, I'll give you a, a heads up on some of these. Uh, the methodology memorandum does need to describe the methods that will be used to develop alternatives and then the criteria that we're going to use to appropriately evaluate each and, and hopefully eliminate some, right? So from the part one webinar, you will recall that specific planning and environmental linkage conditions are going to apply on the back end of your study to, uh, to double check that the methods that you used were acceptable to your agency partners and then are uh, appropriate for later incorporation to the PD&E study. So you've got to be very careful with method. So this description should cover how alternatives are going to be developed and then how alternatives will be evaluated. So some real quick ideas for evaluation criteria would certainly include whether they meet purpose and need, are there any potential impacts to resources and infrastructure, Engineering feasibility, of course, cost, uh, public and agency input or outcry, if you will, on some alternatives. Uh, do you have local government support? And quite frankly, do you have are you are your alternatives consistent with local plans? That could come to uh, to roost a little bit later on. Sometimes, uh, in specific cases, we might consider constructability and phasing considerations. And then, as you can imagine, there's just a whole host of other aspects. And all these are unique to each project. To, to each project. So, as well, your A study team might decide to use a corridor ranking system. Sylvia is going to cover this in lesson three. But if that's the case, I'll give you the heads up that uh, we do want to be consistent uh, statewide with our agencies on how we do that. So this is a great opportunity to, to check in with OEM. They might have some uh, recent successes to report or maybe even some lessons learned from, uh, from other districts. Next slide. So as we move on to eliminating alternatives, um, certainly we want them to meet purpose and need, and then we're going to use screenings and 
we're probably in early stages going to use qualitative type comparisons and narrative assessments. And then as you start moving into further refinements, we, we might move toward qualitative measures, which by the way, I'll tell you have a less, uh, less lengthy, can have a less lengthy lifespan than others. So you got to be careful here. Um, sometimes you'll do quantitative measures during your ACE study. Sometimes you might wait for PD&E. And I think Sylvia is going to cover those more in detail. So I'll punt on that as well. So finally, we get into the uh, public and agency input that should be described. Um, this should include a coordination and public engagement meeting. In fact, uh, one of our best practices that we're hearing from districts is it's a great idea to develop a public involvement plan as part of your process. It's essential um, for documentation, by the way, and this is a Pell requirement, just kind of like we have to do for pd &E studies. Uh, we have to, it, it, it's essential to document any of the comments that you receive and show that you considered those before you make your final decisions. As well, I will tell you there are laws and regulations that require public engagement and an opportunity to comment at key milestones in your study. So something good for your back pocket. Moving on, next slide. Okay, so you work through this, you've got a uh, draft methodology memorandum that you want to review. And so uh, the first thing that we wanna do is uh, submit this to the lead agency for a 14 day review period. And then after meth any uh, modifications that you might make, the methodology memorandum is then uploaded into the environmental screening tool for a second. So this is the second preliminary screen review by the, your ETET team. And that's a 30 day review. And um, of course, one of the best practices that's been identified for, by districts is, hey, grease the skids. Um, before you perhaps send this to the lead agency for review, it's a, it's always a nice thing to uh, set up a meeting and just walk them through the project with your draft methodology memorandum. Maybe they'll point out some things that you modify and then you send in a, a slightly revised draft that's better and it's gonna, gonna work better for them. Next slide. So we're then gonna get into the lead agency review. Uh, I wanna pause for a moment and talk about a lead agency. So for federally funded projects and certainly under NEPA assignment now in Florida, FDOT acts as the lead federal agency. So the district project team would coordinate the methodology memorandum with the Office of Environmental Management. For state funded projects that are gonna use a uh, state environmental impact report, then the district itself is the lead agency. There could be some nuances here. So if you got any questions, OEM, again, is a great resource to help you. Um, after the uh, district uploads the memorandum for the ETAT and public review, then uh, the comments are gonna come in. So it's, it's always helpful as well to have a uh, follow-on meeting, if you will, with the lead agency to review and respond to any of those comments received. And certain, certain situations might actually warrant that uh, maybe there's some concerns, maybe ETAD has some questions. So there might actually be a second review of the methodology memorandum that you might want to conduct. Um, in that case, it's often good, up, good to get up with OEM, particularly if they're the lead agency, right? And then uh, think about a best approach. Next slide. So as we're moving toward approval of the methodology memorandum, uh, when the lead agency itself, which might be you, is comfortable with the document contents and quality, then the memorandum is approved. And so then your district ETDM coordinator would uh, republish the ETDM preliminary screening summary report that has the methodology memorandum attached. And then uh, that essentially completes this step. And so now you have a, a solid and pre-coordinated plan in place, and now you're cleared to conduct the ACE study. So let's talk real fast about situations that come up with the next slide here. Uh, you could have some situations that require updates and uh, basically a revision to your methodology memorandum. And so um, some of these reasons might be, for example, maybe there's a new technology or a new analysis method that you want to apply. Maybe um, your stakeholder input has changed uh, 
and that, that's prompt, prompted a change in method. Um, you might have a revision to purpose and need, which is not at all uncommon. Uh, changes to project termini, uh, scope or concepts. Maybe you have a, a, a different number of lanes now based on a new traffic count or uh, a newly identified interchange that is needed for that new mall, right, that you found. So uh, you might as well have changes to supporting data. So whatever the reason is, changing a methodology memorandum is not something that you just do on, on the side. It requires a process. It's, this is a process change and it requires coordination with the ETAT. So in this case, a consult with OEM is really a good thing to, to think about because they might have some lessons learned from others as well. Next slide. So to summarize, these are some of the best practices that we've found that's beneficial to coordinate, pre-coordinate, if you will, with OEM on your analysis methodology, um, even before you start. We're hearing from districts that it's often a good idea to develop a traffic methodology and a memorandum, making sure that it's consistent with what you think you're going to do in PD&E for any updates. It is critical, we're hearing, to develop a public involvement plan and, like I said, uh, establish those key milestones and making sure that you're touching base then. Um, because I will tell you, the, uh, on the back end, those Pell conditions are very specific in that area, so this is an area to watch out for. It also, uh, uh, as I said, helps to grease the skids by holding those uh, walkthrough meetings with your lead agency, maybe as the draft memorandum is uh, about to be submitted to them, and then after you have some comments um, as well. So with that, I think we can uh, open it up for questions. Pete? Thanks, Ted. Okay. Um, one of the things, Ted, um, that we've been asked is, can you expand on the MM lead agency review and approval process? Is that review done uh, through the ERC? How is the official approval done? Email, signature page, uh, signature authority. And if you're not that sure, I can I can take it as well. I actually, as I read it, I realized I, I know all that. You're the man that handles those, so yeah, why not you? <laughs> okay, all right. So um, the way that that works is, uh, it's handled just like a, a normal uh, approval. With, so the one thing to think about, um, Cesar, is that it's um, occurring within the environmental screening tool because it's part of the ETBM process. So when we share it out with partners, it's uploading a document. Um, we're sharing it um, with the lead, just like we would do a pre-screening review on a project for all the alternatives and the purpose and need before it goes out for review. It's the same thing um, before the MM uh, goes out and is vetted with everybody. It goes to the um, to OEM or the district, depending on who the lead is, where they just you know verify that it looks right. They would be sent a link to it, just like they would anything else. They get an email. It has a link. They have the ability to review it. They can provide feedback, and then ultimately there's a spot where they they physically sign off on it, just like they would approve the purpose and need. Uh, or anything else. So it's not done in uh, ERC, it's actually done as an upload within the environmental screening tool. The way it goes out to the ETAT is the same way it goes to the lead, the same way they would do a class of action uh, determination, it's the, it's the same activity. It's an email with a link with the information, review the information, there's a spot where they, they sign off on it. So that's mechanically how it works. And I'm not seeing any other questions. Does anybody have any? Uh, we'll give you guys just a, a few more minutes. Um, one of the questions I did answer just a few minutes ago was just the idea of um, how do you balance between making sure that your alternatives uh, meet the purpose and need um, versus the environmental uh, impacts and avoidance and things like that. And really what we, we focused on was just the idea, and I just wanna make sure you guys understand. Before the ACE process existed, already in regulation, you can already, ahead of PD&E, remove and eliminate alternatives that don't meet your purpose and need. We didn't develop the ACE process to eliminate alternatives that didn't meet purpose and need. You already had the, the mechanisms in place to be able to do that. If you want to be able to evaluate and eliminate an alternative for something other than it not meeting purpose and need. And you can establish that in your methodology memorandum. There's additional checks and balances and decision points and documentation points that have to happen. 
which is really the genesis of the ACE process in particular. It's got to be open. It's got to, you've got to develop a methodology. People have to have an opportunity to review the methodology. The methodology has got to be approved. Then you go apply the methodology. And as long as you apply the approved methodology as was stated and shared with everybody, then that gives you the ability then to see what can continue forward and what really should be eliminated. That provides the sufficient justification. And of course, you got to do that in all these coordinated ways, right? You got to share it with the public. It's got to go out to the stakeholders and all of those various things. And that's sort of the entire point of the ACE process is recognizing we already have the ability that if something doesn't meet the purpose and need, we can eliminate it already. But it's for all those projects where we want to have another mechanism to potentially evaluate all our, our alternatives and eliminate one of them for something other than it not meeting the purpose and need, because we're assuming if you're in our process, it meets purpose and need, um, then you need to go through these extra steps, and that's developing the methodology memorandum, going through the process, documenting everything, getting approval, um, all the things we're, we're covering today. And, you know, one clarification there, Pete, I, I think we Please. can never go light on meeting purpose and need. You always have to meet your purpose and need, or we shouldn't be carrying it forward, and certainly FHWA is not going to fund it if it's federal. So um, with that in hand, then to me, it becomes an idea, an, an aspect of, um, are we going to have a Cadillac project or are we going to have to tighten our belt? If we're skirting the Everglades, for example, then we're going to have to consider um, reducing our cross section and, and uh, tightening things. Uh, but, but that can have adverse effects. It can, uh, median width, for example, reduce median width can affect safety. And so that's where the balance occurs to me is uh, after purpose and need is achieved. 